Satan felt at home there. In the first century, it was the place where Satan dwells. In the 20th, it inspired Adolf Hitler. From the first burnt sacrifice, believers were killed for this, to the final solution. Jewish people in Germany were subjects of the Reich, but not citizens. Discover the mystery of the Pergamon altar. It was one of the darkest, eeriest cities in the whole Roman Empire. The horrors of human sacrifice. They would take the victim, place him inside the bull, then light a huge fire under the bull. And as the fire heated the bronze, the person inside the bull would slowly begin to roast to death. The city known as the Seat of Satan, next. In the book of Revelation, Jesus told the Apostle John to write letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. One of them was the church in Pergamum. Jesus called the city the place where Satan dwells. And recently, I went to the ruins of Pergamon to find out how the city earned its reputation as the seat of Satan. I, John, was on the island that is called Patmos. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Today, all that's left of Pergamon are ruins. But when the Apostle John wrote his letter to the church there, it was one of the most influential cities in the Roman Empire. Pergamum had a unique status that was different than any other city because it was the political center. And it was from there that all of the rulings were made, which affected the whole of Asia Minor. The city's Acropolis rivaled Athens, and its library was the second largest in the ancient world with a collection so great that the Roman general Mark Antony presented it as a wedding gift to Cleopatra. At the end of the first century, Pergamon was a thriving city. So why does the book of Revelation call it the dwelling place of Satan? The answer lies in the ruins of the city's temples. On one side, it was a very beautiful city. But on the flip side, it was one of the darkest, eeriest cities in the whole Roman Empire. The people of Pergamon were known as the Temple Keepers of Asia. The city had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman Emperor, another for the goddess Athena, and the great altar of Zeus, the king of the Greek gods. Many scholars believe this altar is the throne of Satan mentioned in the book of Revelation. That word throne was first used to describe a chair that was used in a personal private residence. And it was the chair for the Lord of the house, the master of the house. The very fact that Jesus would use that word in this verse means Satan felt at home there. He sat on a throne there. It was his territory. He was the master of that house. The city also had a healing center called the Asclepion. It was built in honor of the Greek serpent god Asclepios. In the first century, this was a cross between a hospital and a health spa, where patients could get everything from mud baths to major surgery. Even the emperors came all the way from Rome to be treated here. But this was no ordinary doctor's visit. If you were a terminal patient, then you were not allowed to go into the Asclepian. And these Asclepian priests didn't want anyone hearing somebody had died in the Asclepian. And in fact, there was a huge sign just above the official entrance to the Asclepion which said, death is not permitted here. So the only way you're gonna get in to begin with is if they knew you were gonna live. Patients entered through this underground tunnel. Then they drank a sedative and slept here in the dormitories. 
while non-poisonous snakes crawled around them all night. They were told that the serpent god Asclepios would speak to them in their dreams and give them a diagnosis. It was believed that the snakes actually carried the healing power of Asclepius. And if a snake slithered across you while you were sleeping at night, that was a divine sign that healing power was coming to you. The next morning, the patients told their dreams to the priests who prescribed their treatments. Finally, the patients made clay sculptures of the body parts that needed healing and offered them to Asclepios. The people of Pergamon worshiped a myriad of Greek and Roman gods, but when Christianity arrived with the belief in just one god, the city's pagan priests went on the attack, and their most famous victim was a man named Antipas. In the book of Revelation, Jesus called Antipas my faithful martyr. He was the bishop of Pergamum, ordained by the apostle John, and his faith got the attention of the priests of Asclepius, who complained to the Roman governor in Pergamum. The priests testified that demons appeared to them in their dreams and told them that the prayers of Antipas were driving them out of the city. He had cast out so many devils that the demons, the spirits, had been complaining to pagans, you've got to do something about this Antipas. Antipas was ordered to offer a sacrifice of wine and incense to a statue of the Roman emperor and declare that the emperor was Lord and God. He refused. If you reject the divinity of the emperor, it's the equivalent of rejecting the city of Rome. And believers were killed for this. Antipas was sentenced to death on the altar of Zeus. Most of that altar survives today, and surrounding it are some of the world's most famous marble friezes. They portray the battle between the Greek gods and the giants. At the top of the altar was a hollow bronze bull designed for human sacrifice. They would take the victim, place him inside the bull. They would tie him in such a way that his head would go into the head of the bull, then light a huge fire under the bull. And as the fire heated the bronze, the person inside the bull would slowly begin to roast to death. And as the victim would begin to moan and would begin to cry out in pain. His cries would go through all of the pipes which were in the head of the bull, so it seemed to make the bull come alive. Even in the midst of the flames, Antipas died praying for his church. A few years later, the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, mentioning the death of Antipas on this very spot. Here in Pergamon, all that's left is the foundation. Today, the altar of Zeus is more than a thousand miles away. In the 19th century, German engineers dismantled the altar and took it to Berlin. The so-called throne of Satan went on display in the city's Pergamon Museum in 1930 just in time to inspire one of the most brutal dictators the world has ever seen. Still ahead. There is such a thing as evil, in my judgment, and this man is evil. From ancient Pergamon to modern Germany, the seat of Satan, redesigned by the Nazis. Speer gives all the credit to Hitler. There were drawings of all these things that were given to Speer by Hitler. Next, on The 700 Club. In 1934, Adolf Hitler appointed Albert Speer as the chief architect of the Nazi party. One of Speer's first assignments was to design the parade grounds for Hitler's rallies in Nuremberg. Speer based his design on a 2,000-year-old pagan altar from the ancient city of Pergamon, a place known in the Book of Revelation as the Seat of Satan. Ancient Pergamon, the center of pagan worship in Asia Minor, once known as the place where Satan dwells. In the first century, it was a thriving city. 
But after countless wars and natural disasters, the temples of Pergamon lay in ruins. By the mid-19th century, the once great city of Pergamon was barely a memory. The locals were using the site as a quarry, looting the marble for new buildings. Until 1864, when a German engineer paid a visit. Karl Hummann was shocked by the destruction of the priceless artifacts. So he got permission to excavate the ancient city himself. And what he found was one of the greatest monuments in history, the Altar of Zeus. Stone by stone, the altar was excavated and brought here to Berlin. And then it was reassembled and placed in its own museum. The Pergamon Museum was finished in 1930 with the altar as its centerpiece. Eventually, it caught the eye of a young man named Albert Speer, the new chief architect for the Nazi party. Adolf Hitler had commissioned him to design the parade grounds for the party rallies in Nuremberg. And for inspiration, Speer turned to the Pergamon altar. Speer gives all the credit to Hitler. I think that he's like a good interior decorator that someone hires, and that client already has the ideas of what he wants to do, and the decorator agrees with him and just fulfills them. So that's what Speer did. Using the altar as his model, Speer created a colossal grandstand at the rally grounds. It became known as the Zeppelin Tribune. After the war, only a small part of it was left standing. In the middle of the grandstand, where the altar to Zeus stood in ancient Pergamon, Albert Speer built Hitler's podium. Hitler wanted to create what he called a mass experience, and Speer came up with the perfect idea. Most of the Nuremberg rallies were held at night, so Speer surrounded the grandstand with 150 searchlights. The columns of light extended for miles in the sky, creating the mystical effect Hitler wanted. The concluding meeting in Nuremberg must be exactly as solemnly and ceremonially performed as a service of the Catholic Church. This effect was known as the Cathedral of Light, and it became a hallmark of Hitler's events. It was even used in the closing ceremonies of the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Hitler is very much aware of German mythology, and anytime you look at mythology and gods, you're looking skyward. So I don't think it's an accident that uh, he says to Speer, let's create an environment of looking towards the heavens. And that's what it does. Inside the rally grounds, thousands of Nazi party members marched in torchlight parades. These events happen at night, which gives a contrasting effect of fear, of strength, of the unknown, of mystery, and that's all intended by him. He's very theatrical. Torchlight fire has always been part of even pre-Christian beliefs, so I think there's a kind of a quasi-mystical, semi-religious content to these, uh, these torch parades. There's many of them in Nazi Germany. From his podium, Hitler mesmerized the crowds not every one of you sees me, and I do not see every one of you, but I feel you, and you feel me. Then, under the Cathedral of Light, thousands of Germans swore what they called a holy oath. Blazing flames hold us together into eternity. No one shall take this faith from those who are dedicated to Germany. From 1933 to 1938, hundreds of thousands of people gathered here every September for the Nazi Party Congress. But it was the 1934 Congress that captured the attention of the world, thanks to what may be the greatest propaganda film of all time. The 1934 Party film is the consummate picture of Hitler. That's it. No other film was ever made of him. And he didn't want any other film made of him. Everything that he wanted people to know about the Nazis is in that film. It was shown continuously for 12 years in Germany. Triumph of the Will was directed by a young German actress named Leni Riefenstahl. 
She was a famous movie star. I would characterize her sort of as a female Indiana Jones. And she was pretty and shapely and popular, romantic films escapist. Hitler's a bit of a romantic. And so he liked her. The film portrayed Hitler as a godlike figure, the savior of the German people. Hitler's entrance in the film is from the sky, as a messiah would be descending down through the heavens, through the clouds, to the faithful waiting for him below. And any time he appears, the, any people that are anywhere near up close to him have these starry-eyed looks in their eyes, glazed looks almost, as if they're in the presence of an unearthly being. That's intentional. In his speeches, Hitler often borrowed Christian phrases, like in this scene with the Hitler Youth. After they sing their song devoted to him, Hail Hitler to Thee, which is almost like a religious chant, he goes into his speech and, and he says things like, you are flesh of our flesh and blood of our blood. Well, he borrows that from the Roman Catholic ritual, with which he's very familiar. It's a very physical statement, and it resonates with that crowd. Hitler's popularity skyrocketed after the release of Triumph of the Will. The next year, more than a million Germans came to Nuremberg to hear his speech. On the evening of September 15, 1935, Hitler announced the Nuremberg Laws, laws that took away German citizenship from Jews. The law for the protection of German uh, uh, blood and German honor is intended to begin the marginalization process of the Jewish people. Hitler had a lot of popular support for much of his time in office. One doesn't get popular support by saying to the public, we're going to put Jewish people in gas chambers and then incinerate them. You don't do that. What he did was gradually marginalize them. It was also here that Hitler used the phrase final solution for the first time in public. Bitter complaints have come in from countless places citing the provocative behavior of Jews. This law is an attempt to find a legislative solution. If this attempt fails, it will be necessary to transfer the Jewish problem to the National Socialist Party for a final solution. The Nuremberg Law stripped the Jews of their rights as citizens. They couldn't teach in public universities. They couldn't practice medicine in public hospitals. They couldn't fly the national flag. Then that was coupled with the Reich Citizenship Law, which said that Jewish people in Germany were subjects of the Reich, but not citizens. Hitler's final solution is now known as the Holocaust from the Greek word that means a holy burnt animal sacrifice. In 8092, the faithful martyr Antipas died, a holy burnt sacrifice on the altar of Zeus in Pergamon, the place the Book of Revelation calls the throne of Satan. Centuries later in Nuremberg, in the center of a redesigned Pergamon altar, the bronze bull was replaced by a podium from there, Adolf Hitler announced his final solution to the world. And this time, the burnt sacrifice was six million Jews. After the war was over, Albert Speer said, it's hard to recognize the devil when he has his hand on your shoulder. What are the signs of the Antichrist? What are the evidences uh, that someone has uh, this spirit, the spirit of Antichrist? Well, let's look first to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. When you look at this verse in 1 John, you start understanding there isn't just one Antichrist, there are many. There is a major one to come, but there have been many in history who have set themselves up as against Jesus, against the Messiah, against the Holy One of Israel. And here's how they do it. You find it also in 1 John. This is chapter 4, verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. 
And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So as John's telling us, this is already here and it's been here for thousands of years. And, and how do you recognize when someone has this spirit, someone who acts as one of the many Antichrists? Well, here's a clue, and this is directly from Jesus, and he's prophesying about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And it's interesting, his disciples come to him and say, well, when will these things be? And, and what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so there's a three-part question here. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 answers all three questions, but specifically adds in a unique phrase that comes from the book of Daniel. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And some marginal notes say this is the Antichrist. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, this specific prophecy of Daniel, some claim, has, was fulfilled already before Jesus was even born. Uh, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes came, and he uh, slaughtered Jews. About 80,000 were killed. And in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, he set up a statue of, of Zeus. And there he offered sacrifice, and he sacrificed a pig in the Holy of Holies, uh, and, he, and he, the abomination of desolation in the Holy of Holies, and he offered a pig there. 80,000 Jews died. It was illegal to be Jewish. It was illegal to circumcise. It was illegal to observe the Sabbath. It was illegal to offer sacrifices. And all of this had happened before Jesus was even born. So he's prophesying yet another abomination of desolation uh, from the book of Daniel that would come. His name was Titus, and it happened within a generation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It happened in AD 70. And Titus came and he looted the temple. And behind me, you can see the Arch of Titus, which still stands in the city of Rome. And it, you see the golden menorah that had been taken. You see the silver trumpets, articles from the temple that were taken as trophies back to the uh, city of Rome by the then-to-be Emperor Titus. And he set them up in, in, in a special temple uh, and offered sacrifice to them there. Now, what did Titus do? He absolutely destroyed Jerusalem. He tricked the Jews and said, if you want to celebrate Passover, you can go into the city. And then when the city was filled, he then shut the gates and he literally starved them to death. Uh, from roughly April to August in AD 70, 1.1 million Jews were killed. And after he took the city, uh, the reports are that he then set up a statue of himself and a Rogen, Roman legion came in and offered sacrifice in the Holy of Holies to Titus. And he put himself in the place of God in the temple in Jerusalem. Here's what Titus had to say. And you find this from Philostratus. He wrote uh, contemporaneously and he said this, he quoted Titus. After Titus had taken Jerusalem, and when the country all around was filled with corpses, the neighboring races offered him a crown. But he disclaimed any such honor to himself, saying it was not himself that had accomplished this exploit, but Mary had merely lent his arms to God, who had so manifested his wrath. This is one of the signs of the Antichrist, one of the signs of the abomination of desolation. And there is yet to be filled because we know from both the writings of Paul, the man of sin, uh, from the writings of John and Revelation, uh, and from the words of Jesus, that there will yet be another Antichrist who will come, who will try to set himself up in the Holy of Holies. Here it is from Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 to, through 26. These are the signs of the Antichrist. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. 
His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Now, Daniel here is quoting an angel, and that angel is giving him the keys. Let's look at each one. A king shall arise. When you get the, the understanding, it's a, it's a king. Uh, it's an absolute ruler. And you can call them emperor. You can call him a Caesar. You can call him a Fuhrer. You can call him a chairman. You can call him all kinds of things. But you've got to understand, he has absolute rule. When he makes a decree, it becomes the law of the land. Second, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He'll have unusual things. The book of Revelation talks about he'll have the ability to give signs and wonders. He'll be so unusual in his power that even the elect can be deceived by what he's doing. So when you look at uh, the Antichrist that have arisen, Titus said, well, it wasn't, I didn't destroy um, Jerusalem. I just lent my arms to God. Uh, you start to understand what's going on. The, the Fuhrer said he, he was tapping into the Third Reich, the third millennial reign of the great German people. They always attribute that it's not their own power. They're tapping into some supernatural power. Third sign, he shall destroy fearfully, and then he shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. Start understanding, what does the Antichrist go after? He always goes after the holy people. And whether that's Jews or Christians, he targets them and tries to wipe them out. He exalts himself in his own heart, and then he shall destroy many in their prosperity. So we see destruction, destruction fearfully, destroying the mighty, destroying the holy people, and destroying many in their prosperity. He brings poverty. He brings destruction. He brings genocide against the holy people. And the final clue, he shall even rise against the prince of princes. He exalts himself against the Messiah, against Jesus. He puts himself in the place of the Messiah, and that's the final sign. Where's the hope? He shall be broken without human means. When we understand that God himself will intervene, God himself will bring a resolution to the Antichrist, then we can rest secure knowing our future and our hope are with him.